Hey everyone, how's it going? Happy Earth Day 2023. Today is April 22nd, and instead of doing kind of the usual show where I just recap the news of the week, I wanted to dive into this idea of the carbon footprint of the US dollar. So if you're a Bitcoiner over the last few days, weeks, you've probably seen a lot of articles from mainstream publications coming out about how bad Bitcoin mining is for the environment. And, you know, every Bitcoiner has had this conversation uh, with someone like, oh, mining is so unsustainable. It uses so much electricity, it uses fossil fuels. And there's a whole bunch of, you know, rebuttal to all that. And we'll definitely dive into that. But what I wanted to talk more about in this show is, okay, if we're criticizing Bitcoin for its carbon footprint and electricity usage, how much goes into maintaining the US dollar as the reserve currency? Because as we all know, uh, if the US dollar you know collapses tomorrow, we have a lot of trouble in the world. Trade itself doesn't work. Things don't function. Everything in the world when it comes to economics is all based around the US dollar. And it's so important uh, for, you know, I guess the relative stability of the world, whether you think it's stable or not, to have something like a reserve currency, a kind of a stable metric that you can base all sorts of things off of like prices and other units. So what we're going to dive into in this show is we're going to try and kind of break it down as simply as possible. I know not everyone in this audience is super deep into all this Bitcoin macroeconomic stuff. I myself, I'm not an economist. I didn't even take a economics course when I got my degree. Um, this is all stuff that I've just gathered from my own research, and I'm going to just do my best to present it in kind of the easiest, cleanest way possible. And the things we're going to talk about today are, number one, what is a reserve currency? What does that even mean? And how did the U.S. become the world's reserve currency as we know it today? How did it almost fail at kind of taking up that role and kind of rejuvenate itself into the current system that we have today called fiat currency? How much carbon is emitted from protecting this system of fiat currency, the U.S. dollar? Uh, you know, where the carbon comes from when it comes to the military, where it comes from in the actual banking system itself, and then the secondary effects of having a currency that is not linked to a hard commodity. And then why, in my opinion, emissions are required in order for the U.S. dollar to maintain its reserve currency status and why that demand alone dwarfs anything that Bitcoin will ever you know, produce or use over its potential lifetime. And then ultimately ending on the final point, which is why I think Bitcoin is superior for the environment as opposed to the dollar system that we have right now. So a lot of things to cover there, uh, but we'll kind of go step by step, kind of build a little bit of a thesis, share some really interesting stats, history about all this if you don't exactly know where all of it came from. And then, yeah, I'll open up the comment section at the end. We'll give away 30,000 sats um, and uh, yeah, have a good time hopefully doing this on this wonderful Earth Day. All right, so... Let's start number one. What is a reserve currency? A reserve currency is the concept of a currency that is international, yet usually supplied by one domestic entity um, that kind of serves as the main settlement currency for all trade. There can be other reserve currencies. There doesn't have to just be one, um, as is the case. You know, people trade internationally with the euro, the Japanese yen outside their respective borders. But, uh, you know, by far and large, the US dollar is the biggest one with almost all trade and especially one specific thing almost entirely being settled in US dollars, and that's oil. So let's just take a look at like what it takes to become a reserve currency. Like what features do you have to have in order for the world to say, let's use that one. You know, why the US dollar versus every other one? All right. So um, this is a kind of a breakdown of a bunch of different criteria and a couple of the different uh, major currencies in the world in their current standing. And we won't go through all of them, but there's things like, you know, what are people's global reserves in? You know, if you take the sum of all cash reserves in banks, who kind of has the most in what currency? Um, what is the transparency like within that country? What is the stability of that currency relative to goods, right? 
Um, you know, what is the currency? You know, how much of it is used in trade? What is the size of this country's economy? Right? What is the political stability in this country? The four biggest features uh, that I think really matter when it comes to establishing a global reserve currency, something that everyone across the world can kind of recognize for trade are kind of these four things. So number one is stability. And again, this is all relative, right? But stability generally would mean that, you know, when I want to purchase a good from day to day to month to month, I want to have it in a currency where the price of that good on average, you know, whatever that good may be, is not fluctuating rapidly. Because if it is, that's less of a sign that the, you know, the supply and the demand of the good is changing and more of a function of the currency itself being unstable. So generally, the US dollar experiences somewhat lower inflation than almost all of these other currencies, uh, which all have their own inflation rates. And you know, even observing that today, it kind of makes sense. The US dollar, I think right now, uh, the US economy has inflation of about 6%. Meanwhile, in Europe, it's around 10. Uh, the Japanese yen was too low, apparently, for some people at one point. The British pound is over 10%. So even generally, by today's standards, the US dollar is the least volatile of the major world currencies. So it has that stability factor in mind. Uh, another important feature is liquidity. So there's got to be enough of them and they've got to be able to move, you know, pretty instantly between people. If someone's just stockpiling a whole bunch of them and there's not enough to conduct trade between other parties, uh, it's just not liquid enough. It's not really a great thing for reserve currency. Uh, happens to be that there are more US dollars than any other uh, currency in the world by size and scope. Uh, third important factor is confidence. So the people who are using this currency have to be confident in its stability and its reliability. Um, you know, and part of the factor of confidence comes into, well, does this country pay its own debts? Is this country a good faith actor in the world? And you know, we can decry the U.S. for all sorts of things, uh, war crimes, you know, relative political instability. But again, compared to these other nations, um, you know, the euro is a relatively new currency. You know, Japan's gone through major crises. China has closed borders. Confidence in the U.S. dollar is higher because of its openness and its relative stability compared to other currencies. And then lastly, and this kind of, I guess, bundles into the last point, is the size and the openness of the issuing country. So, you know, you have on this chart here the U.S. dollar, the euro, Japanese, and then the Chinese yuan and a couple others. Um, out of all of these places and their respective economies, which one is the biggest and which one is the most open? So the U.S. has the world's largest economy now. Um, it is, you know, easier to invest in the United States than almost any other country's capital markets, bonds, whatever. The U.S. will take any form of investor. Um, and uh, that is a really important and sometimes overlooked part of maintaining reserve currency status. If you have a closed economy uh, and people can't invest in your country and, you know, get access to maybe even your bank notes and your liquidity, then why would anybody want to use your currency internationally? So if your money is not open to the world... Uh, and you're closing your borders for whatever reason, and that reason may not be predictable, chances are pretty low of you becoming a reserve currency. And uh, you know, the more you lean in that direction, uh, generally the more you um, dethrone yourself as the reserve currency as well. Okay, so yeah, basics of reserve currency, you wanna be open, you wanna have people have confidence in you, you wanna be very liquid, and you wanna be somewhat stable. Those are the four kind of biggest elements to reserve currency status. Um, now it's important to kind of note that it doesn't last forever. Uh, you know, in most of our lifetimes, unless you're over the age of like 60 or 70 here, you have only really seen, or you know, even if you're, even if you're that age, you've really only seen one reserve currency, and that's been the U.S. dollar. It doesn't last forever, um, and reserve currency status, you know, has changed over the years. You know, back in the 1400s and 1500s. Um, you know, many countries weren't connected by any form of communication. But now, as the whole world is connected more than ever before, um, everyone is kind of aware of what the reserve currency is and its role in the world. So going back in time, you know, Portugal had the reserve currency, then Spain and the Netherlands, then France, and then Britain, and then the U.S. And so specifically for this next part, I want to talk about, well, oh, hold on, you know, before the U.S. had the reserve currency, it was Britain. What happened for Britain to lose reserve currency status and have the U.S. kind of take it over? All right. So um, there's been some debate as to how long the U.S. has had, you know, or when it started to have reserve currency status. 
But I think the, the easiest reference point to kind of make is roughly around World War II. And so why did the US gain so much power? Why did their currency become so prominent during World War II? Well, in the middle of you know Germany's rampant uh, takeover of a lot of Eastern and, and you know creeping into Western Europe, the UK uh, needed to arm themselves. France needed to arm themselves. And you know Britain's currency, as you know, kind of globally recognized as it was, still wasn't something that Americans really wanted to accept. Obviously, they had a whole history of trying to detach themselves from the British Empire. Um, and so in terms of international trade, it was a little bit in rocky territory. And when this war was going on, it wasn't so easy as just sending over a couple British pounds over to the U.S. to get weapons. Because America was, even at that time, one of the biggest arms manufacturers and the world needed more arms, uh, they had to come up with a way to settle trade. And so what Britain did, actually, for a lot of World War II is instead of sending currency and banknotes over the US to buy weapons, they were sending straight up gold, like gold reserves. And in fact, one of the uh, really interesting things to kind of look at when it comes to World War II is how big of a factor that gold played into kind of keeping that war going on as long as it did and giving certain powers edges in certain places. Um, you know, this image is kind of famous of the U.S. planting the flag here. I'm so bad with history, but I assume this is something with uh, D-Day or not. You can make fun of me in the comment section. Um, but when we talk about gold's role in World War II, we have to realize that Hitler likely would not have been able to expand his empire as big as he did in that short of a time frame if he didn't have a form of reserve in his currency, and that would be gold at the time. So if Hitler just wanted to start war and he didn't have gold reserves, he would have printed and hyper-printed you know, Germany's uh, currency at the time, and he would have hyperinflated and destroyed his own economy. The fact is, is during you know, the early parts of World War II, the German economy was doing really well. And a big part of how Hitler was able to maintain uh, Germany's relative currency stability was that when they went into other countries and they invaded in Austria and Poland, they were ransacking massive, massive quantities of gold. So, you know, when they invaded Austria, for example, they looted around 90 tons of gold. And uh, then going back to Britain, when they needed more arms, uh, they were sending tons and tons of gold by freighter across the Atlantic Ocean over to the United States as part of their trade agreement for the first little bit. Eventually, the U.S. came around and, you know, just started loaning them uh, or lending them the weapons to be paid back at a later date. But for the earlier part of World War II, uh, the UK, in order to settle trade with the US, had to send them tons and tons of gold reserves. In fact, one of the most interesting stories is uh, there was something called Operation Fish, where the UK had to move about $31 billion of gold uh, over to Canada uh, for safekeeping because they were really worried during kind of the bombing of London uh, that you know their reserves might be plundered as well and they wanted to keep their relative wealth. So they had to make an allyship with Canada and the US to kind of store some of their reserves. So imagine that $31 billion worth of today's gold at the time crossing the ocean on this, uh, you know, trying to be as covert as possible mission so that they wouldn't get bombed or attacked by the Germans while doing so. So again, gold plays this huge, huge impact in World War II. But what kind of happened shortly after that is that what, when World War II is all settled and, and done for, the U.S. ends up holding tons and tons and tons of gold. And it's not something like they're just going to, you know, resettle it to all these different places without some concessions first. They earned that gold, right? They helped out in the war. They helped the Allies win the war. And, uh, you know, they made a ton of gold in the process by supplying arms and all these other things necessary for uh, the Allies to win. And so since all these countries like, um, you know, UK and France had gotten rid of their gold, they needed to figure out what to do to kind of stabilize their currency. And so at the time, they created this thing called the Bretons, uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement. And so what the Bretton Woods Agreement is, is that um, all of the kind of centralized banks around the world would kind of work, or all the central banks around the world that were you know part of the Allied Nations and, and some others would work together to establish a uh, a fixed exchange rate for the US dollar because the US dollar had this fixed exchange rate with gold. And so easiest way to kind of visualize this is after the Bretton Woods agreement, um, there was no like, oh, the pound is worth like X one day and X the other. It was all kind of fixed. 280 pounds was worth, um, you know, one American dollar and 35 American dollars was worth one ounce of gold. So you had that kind of fixed system 
And once they establish that, uh, the central banks of all these countries, instead of stockpiling up on gold to back up their currencies, they said, well, I mean, the US dollar is basically as good as gold. And because it's a paper note, it has all those features that make it more easily transportable than physical gold and more divisible and, and things like that. So things kind of hunky-dory after World War II. Um, problem is, is that obviously, um, oh, sorry, second part to all of this um, before moving on is as the world started stockpiling up on US dollars instead of gold, they also said, well, what's another thing that we can do to kind of back our reserves? And they started buying US treasuries as well. And so what that enabled the US to do is also issue debt. So instead of just buying US dollars, which don't yield anything, they said, well, the US seems good on their debts. Their economy is doing really well. Might as well stick it in these things called T-bills as well. And they might pay, you know, two to 8%, whatever the interest rates were back then. And, uh, you know, very liquid as well as dollars. So yeah, might as well back those up in our reserves as well. Um, and so this enables the U.S. to say, hold on, everybody wants our dollars and everybody is willing to kind of buy our debt. You know, why not take advantage of that? And so throughout the 50s and 60s, uh, the U.S. starts accumulating a lot, a lot, a lot of debt, not only to pay back some of the things that, you know, World War II cost them, but with the big expansion of their country, the baby boom, everyone coming back after, you know, World War II, um, you know, more debt was needed all the time to kind of help the American empire expand. Uh, on top of that, a little something called the Vietnam War starts to get out of hand. That ends up costing a sizable fraction of uh, what World War II costs at the time, and it's almost entirely bared by America. So you have all these things that start coming up in America where they're just needing to raise as much money as possible. So, you know, they have the Vietnam War, they have, uh, Lyndon Johnson has these great welfare programs going on. You have the massive population expansion, which of course requires, you know, more roads, more buildings, more housing, all these things, right? And the US economy uh, was not producing enough to cover all the new expenses being accrued. And so, what happens is this starts to get a little bit out of hand. Uh, into the 70s, a lot of people start seeing what's going on in America and all these other countries say, oh man, we have uh, a lot of our reserves in US dollars and a lot of our reserves in US bonds. The US is going on a little bit of a spending spree. It's like giving your daughter the credit card to go to the mall and she's going a little bit crazy. What if we hedge this a little bit by instead of just only having US dollars, we start kind of buying back a little bit of that gold or redeeming some of our US dollars for gold. And it's nice for us because we don't have to go to the open market to buy gold. We can just give the US Treasury 35 bucks and they'll give us an ounce of gold. And so you start seeing all these countries that you know only a couple of years ago or 20 years ago started hoarding up on US dollars. You start seeing some of them slowly converting it back into gold. And that in essence creates a little bit of a bank run on the US uh, reserves of gold themselves. So what happens is in 1971, and you've probably heard this quoted many, many places before, um, as inflation starts spiraling out of hand in the US and it becomes harder and harder to back up every single one of these US dollars floating around with gold, Nixon comes out and pretty much nixes the, Bretons, uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement, which essentially nullifies the ability to redeem your dollars for gold. So uh, on top of that, by breaking that, he essentially breaks the currency stability. So going back to uh, this image here, uh, we had this big link, this was all settled up, but once you break this kind of bottom half, then you can't really expect, um, you know, $1 to give you 280 British pounds as well. So uh, a couple things there, you know, so Nixon not only uh, does this thing where he breaks the gold window, but also does price freezes, 90 day wage and price freeze, um, you know, in, starts doing import tariffs, all these things just because the US debt is getting out of hand and inflation is getting out of hand as well. And if we look kind of historically, we can see kind of very shortly after breaking that gold window, US inflation spikes uh, over the next couple of years to the highest level it has ever spiked in modern history. Um, and uh, yeah, massive, massive inflation within a 10 year time span. And of course, uh, has a bunch of other knock on effects. We all kind of know, you know, maybe the stats about 1971. But when this starts to kind of break the link um, and you know, dollars are no longer redeemable for gold, uh, productivity still keeps going, but average workers, um, average you know, median compensation starts to delink from productivity as well. Wages start to delink from GDP, et cetera. Um, 
in my mind, this is almost a bit of a hidden default. Like a default is essentially when you have a debt and you can't pay it back and you say, sorry, you know, whatever I promise you, tough luck, right? Um, now those are debts based on loans and this is more of a default based off of like, here's this arbitrary figure that I've linked to a physical commodity. Uh, so it doesn't seem like a default in the same sense of the loan term or the borrowing term that most people are accustomed to, but it's essentially a default by every other metric. Um, so let's go back here. So yeah, gold windows closed. Um, we're back to fixed exchange rates. Now all these other countries have gotten a couple of their gold reserves back. Now currencies are just, you know, free trading kind of everywhere. Um, so the question is, is like, okay, so if, you know, money is not backed by gold, US dollars are not redeemable for gold, there was that bank run, then how exactly, what's the plan? Like how are new US dollars created or removed from the system? Um, and so this kind of goes into this idea of fiat currency, where essentially uh, they are willed or created to, into existence because uh, X or Y person said so. And all of this attempting to will them to, in, into existence without just explicitly just printing them and just giving them out you know, with no terms or strings attached. The idea is that the Federal Reserve would use open market operations essentially when they wanted to create new money because, you know, the world needed more liquidity for whatever reason, they would try and buy an asset. So for every dollar they printed, they would try and scoop up an asset with it or they would buy it from another bank, something like a bond or whatever. And so we have a modern version of this today called quantitative easing. Uh, the challenge is, is Every dollar printed by the Federal Reserve is not necessarily, you know, backed up or reciprocated by a dollar of equivalent uh, assets, right? So that's why you have these balance sheet imbalances where the Federal Reserve has like, you know, nine trillion, you know, excess dollars versus what they actually have on their balance sheet. That's kind of the unbalanced uh, you know, thing that we have going on. And of course that is just accelerated. I don't need to tell you modern history for you to know that. Uh, but that move started basically back in the 1970s. So yeah, you have all these problems going on. The other thing that I, I didn't touch upon quite as much is that while the US was exporting all these weapons and they were just, you know, production powerhouse during World War II, when that ended, they became a net importer of everything. As they had reserve currency status, uh, goods for Americans, you know, importing them and buying things from overseas was super favorable to them. And so they started, uh, you know, the big American spending spree of, you know, the 40s and 50s led to what we have today. Things for Americans are relatively cheaper, cost less of their working capital than any other nation or country or group of people in the world. Uh, Americans can get access to food at a you know a cheap rate. Americans can get access to housing at a, a relatively affordable rate compared to what you know they're paid for in their economy. Um, that doesn't seem like the case today, but definitely for the first you know few years after World War II, Americans had the highest standard of living of almost any other place in the world. Their purchasing power was kind of unmatched, even at like the lower and middle classes. All right, so 1971 uh, comes. Uh, we start to have a little bit of chaos because the dollar is delinked. We have rapid inflation. Americans are importing way too much. Consumers just living it up, borrowing uh, money on on fixed time. And so it starts to get really bad. And then uh, all of a sudden by 1970s, a war starts to break out in the Arab states. So Syria, uh, Lebanon, Egypt, and Israel kind of become embroiled in the Yom Kippur War of 1973, territorial disputes in the Middle East. And essentially this becomes a proxy war for the US and Russia. So Israel is supported by the U.S. in this case, and all these other Arab states, Palestinians, are supported by the USSR. And we won't get into the Cold War history, but yeah, everyone kind of knows USSR, Russia versus uh, America wasn't great back then. And uh, similar to maybe the Ukraine conflict today, lots of proxy stuff going on. Although I guess it's not really a proxy war for Russia anymore, but that's besides the point. Um, what really matters here is that Arab states... Uh, were one of the great exporters to the US. They were providing them with just so much oil for everything, production, everyone has a car now in the US, you know. Um, everyone's using oil like crazy in the US. And the US is doing a little bit of drilling, but not compared to what they're importing from other countries. And so these Arab states uh, see the US backing up Israel and you know arming them and say, well, hold on, this isn't cool. Like, we don't wanna sell you oil anymore. Uh, we're not gonna sell you oil. We're not gonna give you favorable ter terms for oil. 
And so within a, a small window of a couple months, the price of oil skyrockets. And that's on top of all the already existing inflation going on in the US in the 70s. And it's just completely, completely unmanageable. Um, there's a lot of like political upset in the US because of this, similar to what there is today. You know, when things start inflating, everybody looks for someone to blame. But ultimately, uh, the U.S. says we have to do something here because our dollar is not connected to a hard commodity. Uh, we have runaway inflation, and these factors are going to probably eventually uh, endanger the status of the U.S. dollar as a global currency. And so what they decide to do is they come up with this agreement with Saudi Arabia, and, and it's sort of like a rough agreement. It's not like codified as like a specific X, Y, or Z thing. But we know it today as the petrodollar. And we'll dive into what that is in one second here. If you're enjoying this, if I'm making some sense, please give the video a like as well. Uh, helps it just reach more people. Um, so uh, Saudi Arabia, the US, feud over this Yom Kippur war. This is kind of like a general map of you know, the territories here, the Golan Heights. Um, they come to an agreement about the oil situation. And it's basically creates this thing called the petrodollar. And it's kind of complicated to go into like all the different aspects of the petrodollar agreement. So I've made a meme, uh, the trade offer meme, to kind of explain what it is. So the US, I receive all the oil I want and I can pay for it in US dollars. And, um, since I'm paying you with those US dollars, uh, you gotta promise me that you're gonna invest some of those US dollars back into my economy, right? So, so far, pretty good deal for the US. Saudi Arabia, what do they get out of it? Well, you know, Vietnam War has kind of fizzled out past. US still has stockpiles of weapons. Saudi Arabia says, okay, we'll do your deal. We want some of your weapons as well that you didn't use, uh, armed to the gills. And that's how the Middle East ends up getting a ton of weapons that end up in the wrong hands over the next couple of decades. And um, we also agree with your idea of investing into your market for things, sure, but we want priority access to our capital as well. So uh, yeah, we'll invest in your treasuries, but we want access to your companies and uh, we wanna have a bigger say in your economy because we're gonna have all this money. So we don't wanna have any restrictions on how we're gonna spend all those fresh US dollars. And um, the agreement between both of us is, yeah, we will definitely sell you oil, we'll take your dollars for it, and uh, we'll work together to make sure the world adopts this kind of as a currency standard as well. So all oil producing nations and all oil consuming nations uh, should use the US dollar for all of their oil needs. All right, so now you kind of understand where we are today. And this is why I make this video on Earth Day. The US dollar is, is unbreakably tied to oil. It's not backed by oil like it was backed by gold for a limited portion of time, but it is inextricably tied to oil. The oil markets, the stability of the oil trade around the world relies on the US dollar being the primary way of trading such commodity. And you might think, well, why does that like make the US dollar so important in of itself? Like what, you know, oil, yeah, I get it, oil's big, but like how big is oil? Um, oil is bigger than every other commodity and raw metal on earth. It is a massive, 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 massive industry, much bigger than gold, in fact. Um, so yeah, the oil trade can't really ignore it. Um, and it basically allows the US dollar to penetrate every single market on earth. It's the one thing that everyone kind of needs. And the need for it is ever increasing. More people get vehicles, uh, more energy is consumed to make goods, um, you know, and it gives the US dollar that demand that was beginning to kind of slip away from them after kind of dissolving that gold window. So US dollar is back in full force, baby, basically after this agreement. Um, here's sort of how it works. Here's like a little bit of a breakdown of how it works. So the US buys oil from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia pays US corporations for services and technology to extract it all from their land. Uh, the U.S. banks lend out those new dollars to emerging markets to spur global demand for oil. Uh, other countries buy that oil from Saudi Arabia, and then Saudi Arabia puts those dollars into sovereign wealth funds that invest in non-petroleum assets, including U.S. treasuries, and thus driving up the price of the U.S. dollar. So there's this beautiful sort of flywheel here where the U.S. dollar, every dollar that you've ever had, has um, every dollar that you've ever exchanged 
Every American dollar that you've ever exchanged has at one point, if you could track dollars, flowed through the oil industry. It is just unbreakable connection. A new dollar could be printed tomorrow and within weeks or months, it will touch the oil industry in one way or another. It will have some link to it. So that, that bond is huge. And it's the reason why the US dollar, um, in my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of people has kind of floated to as prominent of a status as it is. So it wasn't just enough to make the US dollar the settlement currency for all oil trades. Um, the US had to get involved in oil in other ways as well. Uh, a big way that they kind of protect you know, the price and the stability of oil and oil refining and mining and all that stuff is by having a massive military. And I don't need to dive into this. Um, you know, you can be on whatever side you want, but I think we can all agree that almost every single war uh, America has fought since uh, the ending of the Vietnam War has in one way been to defend oil rights for themselves in one way or another. Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, anything that endangers the oil trade or the US dollar hegemony, both those things are tied together. The U.S. has to get involved. Um, uh, let me just find here. Another big thing, too, is that U.S., being the world's largest economy in the world, they have to consume a lot of this stuff. So, yeah, you can trade U.S. dollars for barrels of oil, but they've also got to make sure that their allocation is carved out for them. There's never shortages for them. They want to ensure you know stability. So we have things like OPEC for oil. But the U.S. consumes one in five barrels of oil in the world today. And uh, that percentage basically means that it almost consumes more than the, the next three countries combined, China, India, and Japan, which is unbelievable if you think about it, because those countries combined have almost six to seven times the human population of the U.S. Their economies combined are bigger than the U.S., but uh, combined they consume about the same amount of oil. And why is that? Like, why is the U.S. consuming so much more oil per capita than every other country? Well, you don't need to look much further than their military. So the U.S. military, some quick stats about them. Uh, Americans are deployed in 177 out of the 195 countries that exist on planet Earth. If you're going to a country that exists on this planet, uh, chances are if you run around it long enough, you will bump into an American soldier, uh, almost guaranteed. So what does it take to maintain those military bases? Well, some of them are big, objectively huge military bases. But when we look at, you know, the, the main ones here, it doesn't look like a lot, but most American troops are stationed in the Middle East or a majority of the amount. So it's about 40% of all American troops are in the Middle East. You got lots in Europe and Japan, South Korea, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, the Middle East is where a lot of them are stationed. What are they doing there? If they're not at war, what are they doing there? Um, well, let's look at energy usage from or oil usage from the U.S. military. So the U.S. military we know consumes a lot of that oil that they want so badly. Uh, but what is actually consuming it? And I thought this was kind of an interesting breakdown, maybe a little bit more microeconomics. But uh, that purple part of this graph right here is uh, basically aircrafts. So tanks are consuming it, sure, land vehicles, but by and large, most of the oil consumed by the U.S. military is through air vehicles. And these are considered next generation fighters. Uh, these can be drones. These can be all sorts of things. And so when we talk about the carbon footprint of the U.S., we have to look at how much the U.S. military consumes. And when we look at how much the U.S. military consumes and we realize that the big consumer within the U.S. military is air transportation, we realize that that is not going to be changing anytime soon. The U.S. will only increase its military budget. Uh, aircrafts, by and large, are this you know generation or this era's way of hosting modern warfare. You know, troops on the battleground are not as big of a thing anymore. Uh, it's all fought in the air, basically, through extremely fast and, and you know, hyper-refined jet fuels. Um, and so there's no alternative to this. You know, we're not going to be coming up with battery-powered jets. I don't even know if it's technologically possible, maybe a hybrid version of it, but these are things that are going at like Mach 10 speeds um, that are, you know, hundreds of degrees Celsius potentially inside their internal engines. Uh, batteries are not going to cut it. The only form of energy and fuel that is going to fuel modern warfare is oil. So that's always going to be a part of the mix here. Um, um, what was the other stat I was going to talk about? So 
I am always wary when it comes to estimations of like how much CO2 or energy does like X, Y, or Z thing use, right? These numbers change drastically when you Google them or try and find peer-reviewed studies. Two peer-reviewed studies will have massive margins of errors between them. Um, but I think it is, you know, it's it's a number to always think about and, you know, take it with a margin of error of like 50 or 100% or whatever you want. Um, but uh, the U.S. military consumes about, f or, 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 uh, emits about 59 million tons of CO2 per year, and that's an average. Um, and you know that average does it go down when there's not an active uh, war that U.S. is fighting? Probably, but that's a that's kind of a uh, average right now, and that number has increased a lot over the last few years. But you know, if you're an American, you know uh, the basic stat, which is that one or or 25 dollars of of every hundred dollars that you pay in taxes go into the military. But of that money that you're using to fund the military, how much of that actually just goes into straight up fuel? It's about $2. So every hundred dollars of taxes that you pay, $2 of it is straight up going into jet fuel, fuel for tankers, whatever. It's straight up just going to Saudi Arabia or you know, going to your own country or other countries. Canada now, I think, is the biggest exporter of oil into the U.S. It's just straight up buying oil. So two dollars of every hundred dollars that you pay as an American taxpayer is just going to buying oil, uh, which is kind of interesting. And again, this doesn't even include the fuel needed in manufacturing, you know, parts or whatever, right? Or or maybe even transportation. Uh, no, it wouldn't include transportation. But yeah, two out of every hundred dollars that you pay the government in your taxes going to oil. Um, so, yeah, and then, you know, you can dive into all sorts of things here. U.S. military emits more CO2 uh, than many other nations. Uh, military fuel consumption treads have gone exponential. The amount of fuel per soldier has gone up, but that's also, you know, part and parcel to us using more mechanized infantry uh, rather than ground infantry. Um, all sorts of things. Uh, I'll save my memes for a bit later. But... Uh, we'll dive in a little bit more on that, but I think the essential thesis from all this that I hope is becoming a little bit more clear is that the U.S. has this strong dependence on oil at every step of the U.S. dollar hegemony. Um, they need it to be the reserve currency for trade. It's the only thing that is creating that demand that was starting to fade after the gold trade. And so tying it to oil has had all these secondary effects of tying it to all sorts of other things. It's not just oil that people trade you know, in American dollars for. When Americans want to buy stuff from China, whatever it is, uh, they can pay in American dollars. They don't have to buy them in Chinese yuan. And you know those relationships go on, and they're very, very complex, and I can dive into it. But essentially... Um, the genesis of the American dollar becoming the bedrock for commerce around the world begins and ends with oil. Uh, nothing else is even close to as important as that. Um, no other individual sector, no other individual commodity is as important as oil is to maintaining the U.S. dollar hegemony. Um, so quick sponsor break uh, um, before we dive into a couple more things about this and then how Bitcoin ties into it and why whatever the U.S. military does with oil or the U.S. government does with oil uh, dwarfs any electrical consumption of Bitcoin. Um, we'll dive into all that. Quick sponsor break. Thanks for sticking with me. Uh, go check them out too. Beaver Bitcoin if you're Canadian. This week's show is brought to you by Beaver Bitcoin. Dollar cost averaging is the most stress-free method to enter the Bitcoin space. And if you're looking for a simplified way of buying Bitcoin in Canada without needing to rely on a custodial exchange, Beaver Bitcoin is your best bet. Beaver Bitcoin lets you set up recurring Bitcoin purchases directly from your Canadian bank account and straight into a Bitcoin address that you control. It's like a savings account in a currency that you actually want or a Netflix subscription that doesn't suck. And if you don't want to wait to stack sats, Beaver Bitcoin supports instant non-custodial Bitcoin buying via e-transfer as well. Give it a shot today at beaverbitcoin.com. All right, um, let's talk about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, uh, you like it, you hate it, whatever. I like it. I talk about it a lot. Um, Bitcoin requires an energy source as well as the U.S., um, but the big difference is the U.S. or Bitcoin does not rely on specific energy or specific policies. It requires a network of individuals to come around consensus rules about how it's run, 
And then to maintain the security of that consensus, it needs to consume a form of energy. And that energy can be, you know, a tiny, tiny amount, or it can be a lot, a lot. It kind of just depends on how many people want to participate. But in general, the more people that mine Bitcoin, the harder it is for any one factioning party to disrupt the Bitcoin protocol or to make changes to it. So the one thing you should know about Bitcoin is that it is secured by energy. It does not require it to run, but its security is dependent on it. You can have shitty security in Bitcoin. The thing is, is that people would probably stop using it. Um, but it doesn't mean that it'll stop outright. You can have, you know, nobody mining Bitcoin and everyone is just attacking it, 51% attacking it, splitting it up, whatever, right? It'll still exist in one form or another. It just won't be that secure and it won't be that useful for anyone. But its usefulness is tied to its security and its kind of inability to have these kind of random arbitrary changes to it. And uh, yeah, that is secured by energy. The difference is uh, as a currency and a monetary network, any energy will do. The US government needs to have their link to oil. They're trying to get away from it, right? This is the whole point of the electric vehicle movement. This is the whole point of drilling at home. They want to reduce their dependence on foreign oil and they want to eventually reduce their dependence on oil as an energy source in general. Or at least they're saying that they're trying to. And again, this is all in service of the environment because less oil use, less CO2 emissions, save the planet, whatever. Problem is, is that uh, a lot of other places don't feel the same way and well-being of other people and, uh, you know, quality of life sometimes trumps the long-term effects of climate change. So the U.S. can do whatever they want, uh, you know, when it comes to climate change, but ultimately uh, that does not mean necessarily there will be a role model for, you know, being more economical with it. There has to be economic incentive to use renewable technologies, to use, um, you know, these things that just take a lot of time to develop and build out versus fossil fuels, which we've been using forever. So uh, let's talk about incentives. Bitcoin uh, has an incentive. Your incentive to use Bitcoin or to mine it is that if you can find a cheap enough energy source, uh, you can create Bitcoin and that Bitcoin may be more valuable than the amount of Bitcoin or money that you spend to mine it in the first place. So that's one incentive. You can profit off of it if you can find cheap energy. Another incentive to use Bitcoin is that by participating in the network, by being a node, you're contributing to uh, the consensus of the network as well. So nodes are really important um, in maintaining, you know, who says what gets into the next block for Bitcoin and, uh, you know, what rules we're going to keep at this certain part of time, right? When you have a node, you basically have a vote in the network in one form or another. Um, but what makes Bitcoin special is as a currency and as a network, uh, it's like a dung beetle for uh, energy users. So Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin security doesn't say we need fossil fuels or we need natural gas or we need solar or we need wind. Bitcoin doesn't care what one you use. Uh, any energy will do because, you know, energy uh, sources convert into electricity. Uh, power mining rigs, which secure the network. So any energy source, as long as it can be converted into electricity, uh, Bitcoin loves it. The nice part about all this is that it turns out that if you want to survive as a Bitcoin miner and you want to survive at mining new blocks of the Bitcoin network and securing the network, uh, if you want to do this, you need cheap energy. And it turns out that uh, while oil is great, it's portable, uh, you know, we have all sorts of machinery that it's compatible with, uh, we know how to, you know, use it as efficiently as possible. Uh, it is not the cheapest way of getting energy. It's just very accessible for a bunch of other uses. It's the best form of energy for cars, right? You can't have solar powered cars, but you can have gas powered cars. Um, so every single energy appliance uses energy um, and it has different demands. Like a car kind of needs to have it immediately and it kind of needs to have a portable energy source like a battery or oil. But when you have an appliance like a Bitcoin miner, it only needs two things, uh, preferably a roof over its head and it needs the internet, and uh, it just needs to be able to plug into something, right? So what that opens up is essentially a new incentive mechanism for money itself. Instead of it being tied to a physical commodity like gold, in instead of Bitcoin you know, having this relationship as a trade vessel for oil, all Bitcoin needs to do in order to secure all of its monetary properties, the security of the network, is have any form of energy anywhere 
and it's good to go. It doesn't even need all the energy in the world. And this is like a big myth of Bitcoin is like, oh, if we adopt it as a global reserve currency, it's going to need all the energy in the world. No, it just needs enough energy so that no other person uh, with their form of energy can co-opt the network, right? It just needs as much as possible to ensure that no bad actor is going to use their energy source against it. Um, and so, I mean, this all sounds great. Like that sounds like a much superior form of money. Why would the U.S. want to attack it. Why is the US being so hostile towards it? Why are the media entities, you know, calling it a big fraud and a Ponzi and saying it uses too much energy and it produces nothing and it has no intrinsic value? Why are they saying all these things? It sounds like it's a great deal for humanity and it's probably a better deal than the system we currently have. Um, and to that I say, uh, memes explain it. So uh, it's a threat. Money can maybe be looked at as like a zero sum game in some ways, uh, but Bitcoin has a couple features uh, which make it much better than the US dollar. And uh, I think people higher up are realizing this and they realize that when people start to realize this, the adoption of it will become a lot easier. The greatest asset that Bitcoin has working against it right now is that it's volatile. That is like the number one argument for people not going out right now and just buying a ton of Bitcoin and only using Bitcoin. That's like literally probably the only argument against it right now at this point. I think if Bitcoin wasn't seen as volatile or its relative volatility compared to the price of goods on a day-to-day -day basis was as stable as the US dollar, everyone would just move to Bitcoin right away, right? Um, but that's not the world we live in. Uh, you know, Free markets mean that things are going to be volatile. And so uh, going back to why Bitcoin is maybe better than the US dollar, we have the Cheebs meme. Uh, Bitcoin you know, proving itself uncensorable. You know, nobody can really censor the Bitcoin network. You can create anonymity where you need it. Uh, individuals can choose not to accept it, but from a network perspective as a whole, Bitcoin is uncensorable between the vast majority of participants. Where else the US dollar, um, you know, we can just freeze your assets, right? Uh, this is a new thing. This is not something that was previously in American history uh, where they saw a wartime partner and they decided to freeze their assets. Even during you know, the Afghanistan and the Iraq war um, and the tensions with the Middle East, uh, the US was not using the power of the SWIFT and the uh, ACH, the banking system, to seize people's money. Uh, they were saying, nope, the US dollar is like a neutral reserve global currency. We may, we may not like what you're doing uh, to us or to another party that we're involved with, but we're not going to freeze your assets. Well, all this changed uh, in you know the invasion into Ukraine by Russia, uh, where they basically said we're going to freeze Russians' assets. And so, whether or not you believe that was a good move or a bad move doesn't really matter. Uh, it does compromise a core part of what makes a reserve currency a reserve currency, and that is that openness to it and that uncensored well, not uncensorability, but that open, uh, reliable nature of it. So the U.S. making political decisions as to what their global reserve currency, which is supposed to be as neutral as possible, is going to do, right? There are arguments being made that if, for instance, Trump was still in office, that he wouldn't have done a move like this. And it's been proven that over the duration of about a year, the sanctions uh, placed on Russia, their ability to use the US dollar and the US banking system have pretty much been toothless. They've just found other currencies to interact with. So again, net negative for the US to uh, start compromising the, um, the openness of their dollar. Uh, second part to all this, and this one I took some fun in, is that Bitcoin, if you understand even a little bit of it, you know it's predictable. So every money needs to have a policy. How much total money is there going to be? Is it going to be open-ended or closed-ended? You know, you know, how much of it is going to flood into the system at any one time? Um, you know, what is, what is the situation like on the monetary policy front? Bitcoin has a very clear monetary policy. Number one, there will only ever be 21 million of it, um, but you know, super, super divisible. And if you need to make it more divisible, uh, you can do that and consensus would probably approve it. And then number two is that, uh, every four years, um, the amount that is going to be placed into the floating supply is going to get cut in half. And what that essentially means is that it exponentially becomes harder for miners to get a higher quantity of Bitcoin over time. Um, and what that means right now is that 92% of all Bitcoin in all of existence are free floating out there. By 2040, it'll be like 99.5%. And then you know, by 2140, all the Bitcoin miners in the world will be competing over a tiny, tiny fraction of Bitcoin that would cost you about $10 today. Um, and you know whether you think Bitcoin's going to be worth a lot or not a lot by the year 2140, the network will still be running. Uh, it will never be stopped. 
and miners will be fighting over what today will cost you about 10 or 20 dollars to buy um let's jump over to the us dollar uh is there a uh is there a limit to how many can be created no there's an infinite amount of money at the federal reserve and then how is monetary policy set? Hmm, well, basically, uh, a bunch of people gather around in a room, a bunch of shamans, they gather around in a room, and they look at some economic data, and they say, hmm, will I raise rates? Will I lower them? And then how will I exactly word that? Because I don't want to say it in, like, the wrong way so that the market takes my information wrong and then maybe we get some disruptions and bank runs or whatever i gotta be very strategic with how i speak about it so will i raise rates will i lower them uh tune in to the first or second wednesday of every month or for some reason every two months and uh watch the fomc and uh find out for yourself and hey guess what you can even place bets on what you think i'm going to do as well and so so much conversation on you know my live stream and the show has been around like what's the fed going to raise the rate to next right and it's like it's insane that we're having bets over something that is so globally and systematically important for all trade that a couple of people uh that are so disconnected from the way the rest of the world works that are behind desks that only care about maybe one factor like inflation or unemployment uh decide how the currency for the rest of the world is going to be issued and worked it's an insane, insane model, uh, and we accept it. We take it at face value, and it is what it is. But, um, yeah, eventually people will realize how crazy that system is, and when they can get over maybe some of the challenges with adopting Bitcoin, uh, they will realize that the short-term hurdles with Bitcoin uh, are nothing compared to the long-term benefits of getting out of a system that is so arbitrary and insane. Um, so we talked about, uh, Bitcoin versus the U S dollar. We talked about Bitcoin has these natural incentives. Uh, it'll consume energy anywhere. Some examples of this are, um, when you drill an oil well, it might be in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you might spike a vein and then you get a whole bunch of methane coming out of it. And there's just no way to clog that up. You can't just like cover it with dirt. The methane gets out, right? Um, or you're going to create some, um, tectonic issues. So you got to let this stuff flare out, right? And sometimes these things are nice and they're close to civilization and you can do something with that methane. But sometimes these uh, little oil veins are way out in the middle of nowhere and there's no economic incentive or capability to get that methane flowing into a useful appliance. So you get these things called uh, methane leaks or methane flares. And traditionally uh, what people have done is they essentially take a lighter to it and they just start burning the stuff because methane straight in the atmosphere way worse, uh, 80 times worse than just CO2. When you burn methane, you just get CO2 as a byproduct. You also get a lot of fire and you also get a lot of energy. So if you are able to do something with it, you can monetize this uh, big pollutant that is infecting the atmosphere. And so for ages, since the dawn of fracking and, and drilling into the ground, human beings have looked for a way to take this byproduct of all that drilling and turn it into something useful. And again, it works if you're close to society. You put a little generator on it, you build some electrical lines, you can send it back to your town. Great, and you can make some money doing it. But there's so many instances where this happens in the middle of nowhere and you can't just send it into a town. The cost to build something like that, nobody is gonna fund that, the government's not gonna fund it, private industry's not gonna fund it, and it might just be physically and, and geographically impossible. And so what are you gonna do? You just either burn it or just let it straight up go into the atmosphere. And believe it or not, uh, a lot of people decide to just let it go in the atmosphere because burning it can also cause uh, you know, ecological concerns. If you have this giant pillar of fire shooting up uh, you know, straight into the sky and you got a bunch of trees around you, um, that's not that safe. That can start forest fires. So what, what are you left with? Just leaking out at, uh, methane as safely as possible. Well, Bitcoin mining is the first tool that can be placed anywhere, location agnostic. You know, you cannot place a data center and use that energy for a data center. That's not going to work. Um, but you can place a Bitcoin miner in these far out locations that leak methane and you can turn it into Bitcoin. And because Bitcoin has an economic value, it has a free market value, you can do stuff with that. You can make a profit on that. Uh, it can pay for your generators and you can create an economic business model. And if you're in a faraway town that doesn't have much going on for it, uh, that money can be funneled right back into the town as well and create an economy where previously there couldn't be one. So again, Bitcoin, it's like the dung beetle of energy. It can use things that other things cannot. Other things are just not as flexible as it using. 
And so I like to talk about Bitcoin's incentives. So let's just say you didn't listen to a word I said on any of this. And I haven't presented maybe the clearest and the best argument for people to, to agree that Bitcoin is amazing for the environment. If you, for whatever reason, uh, think that Bitcoin is bad for the environment um, and you want to see the Bitcoin network fail so that the environment can return to its former glory, you want two things to happen. You want either the hash rate, which is the energy required um, or the energy used to mine Bitcoin. You want the rate of that to increase at a faster rate than the US dollar price of Bitcoin. Because if it becomes harder to mine Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is not profitable, it means that just fewer people are going to mine. And so miners are going to shut off and you're going to have fewer of these big entities, you know, mining Bitcoin wherever and, and using emissions. They're certainly not going to use fossil fuels. There's no point. They're just going to lose money, right? So you want to see Bitcoin security go up, but the price to not really go that, that high if you want Bitcoin to fail. So isn't that interesting? As an environmentalist, if you want to see Bitcoin fail, you really only have two options uh, for your outlook. You either want more people to be securing and protecting the Bitcoin network, but the price to not really reflect that, or you want the Bitcoin price to plummet, but you want there to be more panic with the miners themselves, or sorry, you want there to be less panic with the miners themselves than the buyers and sellers of Bitcoin. So if you want there to be less mining and less Bitcoin destroying the world and the atmosphere, you want the Bitcoin price to fall, but you want there to not be as many miners dropping off. All of it boils down to is that Bitcoin will always have a price. It's never going to go to zero. You can forget about that. And so again, as an environmentalist, you either want to see Bitcoin mining and hash rate grow exponentially faster than Bitcoin's price, or you want Bitcoin price to fall faster towards zero, and you want it to fall faster, the price, than the actual participants dropping out. Either way, you're stuck because at either rate, you're never gonna see miners drop off as fast as whatever the users are uh, in your system. Uh, Bitcoin is going to always, there's always gonna be somebody who can profit off of Bitcoin mining because for some people, energy is basically free. Uh, I might have a dad, my dad's ranch in a place where he just bought a bunch of solar and I inherited that and there's no upkeep on that solar. I'll just mine Bitcoin in perpetuity. I don't care if the price is 10,000, I don't care if it's a dollar. Uh, if I don't have to pay for anything to keep that thing going, uh, then I'll just mine forever and uh, I'll sell it for whatever the market's willing to buy it for. Um, but because of that, uh, you get these uh, things here and this cool graph I have here called Bitcoin hash price index. So this index provided by uh, Luxor basically measures uh, how much that a miner can expect to earn for a specific amount of hash rate in US dollars. So if you put in a certain amount of quantifiable hash rate, uh, you used to be able to make 37 cents uh, per hash rate per day, and now it's like six or seven cents. And, and basically all it boils down to is like, is Bitcoin mining affordable? If you can get energy under a certain price, then yes. And if you can't, then no. And all of this leads into the best incentive mechanism possible, which is that Bitcoin mining incentivizes people to find the cheapest energy in the world. And it just so happens that the cheapest and the most accessible and free energy in the world is renewable energy. The sun emits a metric F ton of energy per day. And only in the last couple of years have human or last couple of centuries have humans found a way to turn that into electricity through solar. Uh, solar energy, super cheap when you can harness as much of it as you can. Solar panels getting exponentially cheaper. Um, wind, uh, it's renewable, not quite as predictable perhaps, but that's also a great way of you know mining Bitcoin if you can do it for cheap. Even better than that, gravity. Gravity is a great source of energy. Gravity is what causes waterfalls to fall and it's what causes waterfalls to almost perpetually run turbines. Sometimes your creek will dry up in a dry spell uh, but generally, most waterfalls are going to be running at the same pace, uh, maybe increased or decreased by you know certain floods or whatever, but probably the most predictable form of renewable energy. Um, and you know, I can go on. Geothermal is like another version of this. You might argue that geothermal is not renewable because you know sometimes it runs out, but geothermal energy can be consistent for millennia. So to us, basically, it's close, as close to renew uh, renewable energy as possible. Um, 
But yeah, that's that. Um, I'm going to just give two rules out that I've found out when it comes to discussing Bitcoin in terms of energy with other people. The naysayers will always use two argumentative tactics as to why Bitcoin is bad for the environment. And the very common one is that Bitcoin uses as much energy as small countries. Uh, Bitcoin uses more electricity than Sweden. It uses more electricity than Argentina. And to that, I have a couple rebuts. My first one is um, U.S. decorative holiday lights use more energy than El Salvador, uh, than Ethiopia, Tanzania, Nepal, Cambodia. Um, It's very intellectually dishonest to use one thing's energy consumption and compare it to something completely different. Uh, Some of us think that Russia shouldn't exist. Some of us think that Ukraine shouldn't exist. Uh, So who are we to say that uh, a country using energy uh, is a better use of energy than Bitcoin? right? People are more important than Bitcoin. Countries, states are more important than Bitcoin. You know, what is, right? So it's very intellectually dishonest, in my opinion, to compare two completely abstract concepts that provide almost unquantifiable amounts of value production and try to compare them against each other as if one is more important than the other just because of, you know, a linguistic or a a assumptatory stance on them. Um, And that leads me to the question is like, what does constitute a good use of energy, right? I mean, you're telling me that every single thing that we use, we consider, hmm, is that a good use of energy or not? No, the only thing that we consider is what benefit does it bring to ourself? And what is the cost of that benefit? And is it worth the cost of that benefit? We don't actually think about, you know, how much electricity something uses as an important factor, whether or not we should use it or not. It's all to do with the cost and it's all to do with the personal benefits and weighing that for yourself. And sure, you can try and, you know, put on your like, oh, this has a societal benefit for X, Y, or Z, but it's, it's all pointless. It's all about our, ourselves, hair dryers, electric shavers, electric toothbrushes. They use 170 terawatts of energy per year globally. Uh, Bitcoin miners use about 140. And again, like I said earlier, it's really hard to estimate these things with accuracy. Consider the margin of error a hundred plus percent. The point being here is that they are comparable uses of energy. And so you got a question like, is drying your hair, is uh, electric shavers and our electric toothbrushes, uh, are they providing more valuable for, so- are they providing more value for society at large than Bitcoin? There is no truth, you know, there is no falsehood when it comes to trying to answer that question. It's all a matter of personal perspective. If you don't use Bitcoin, there's no value in it for you. If you spend all day like me learning about it, then you think it's crazy that anyone could think that. So it's all gonna be subjective. So it's just ridiculous to try and compare Bitcoin's energy usage to a country, to something else, whatever. It's all to do with your individual perspective on how you value energy and the value it creates, all completely different. Um, So uh, the second part I wanna talk about too is that um, when we look at Bitcoin's energy usage compared to other economies or whatever, Uh, in terms of the percentage that Bitcoin relies on renewable energy versus fossil fuels, Bitcoin uses a much higher mix of renewable energy than any other country basically on earth. Uh, The US, only 30% of its uh, energy is sustainable. Uh, India, it's like 11%. Uh, Canada, it's 22%, despite us having just tons of renewable energy here. Um, But Bitcoin, if Bitcoin was a country or a nation, it wouldn't be using nearly as much uh, a percentage of unrenewable energies or fossil fuels as any other country on earth. So again, that tells you something about its sustainability and its desire for the cheapest energy. This number will only increase over time. There's going to be a point where I think the hash rate just gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter, whether or not Bitcoin price is up or down, that basically if you want to survive as a Bitcoin miner or whatever, uh, they're almost going to be all off the grid or they're all going to be in places where renewable energy is the primary electrical source for whatever town, city, country, or economy uh, that it's in. So yeah, and then secondly, um, transaction volume of Bitcoin is not linked to energy usage. This is a common mistake that, you know, even some people in Bitcoin make, but definitely people on the outside, they always say, oh, the more people that use Bitcoin, the more people are transacting in it, the more it's gonna just consume more energy, the more miners there has to be, when it couldn't be further from the truth. 
And so the reason that this is, is because Bitcoin's architecture from a base layer, and again, this is unlikely to ever change. There was one change back in 2012, but from this point on, it's unlikely to ever change. There will only be about 4,000 transactions that can make it into the Bitcoin network um, every 10 minutes. It doesn't matter how much energy usage you're putting into it. The way it's designed is that whether it's one computer in my basement mining or you know millions of computers across the world doing it, you get 4,000 transactions maximum per block. Sometimes it's a lot less than that. Sometimes it's right up to that limit. Every 10 minutes, forever, until the end of time memoriam itself. As long as there's light on planet Earth, Bitcoin will only produce blocks every 10 minutes, uh, 4,000 transactions per block maximum forever. So that stat, completely independent of uh, the mining and electricity usage. Um, all that the electricity does is secure the network. It makes it harder for someone to co-opt it and do their own thing with it. Um, on top of this, that there is, you know, maybe you can say 4,000 transactions every 10 minutes on Bitcoin, sure. And you can try and assign a, you know, it costs uh, $90 of electricity or this much CO2 to send a Bitcoin transaction. All of those arguments are in bad faith because those two metrics are completely unlinked. Um, on top of this, something that will make Bitcoin, if you, if, if that is your metric, if you do believe in that, if you do believe that there is a carbon emission for every Bitcoin transaction, if you're going to be intellectually dishonest and even agree with that, you also have to concede to the point that almost all Bitcoin transactions are going to move off chain onto something called a layer two, which is lightning, which is fediment, which is all these other ways to send Bitcoin without sending Bitcoin through the base layer. Bitcoin like an onion, different layers, like a cake, different layers, right? And so I can send Bitcoin, I can do a, a thousand transactions a second if I want on this second layer. I can only do about seven a second on the base layer. Almost all transactions on Bitcoin, if it ever becomes a big global reserve currency, will happen on the second layer. And there's virtually no electrical cost to run those layer two transactions. These things are peer to peer. So the only electrical cost is, you know, the cost it connects to, you know, have your phone go on the internet, receive data and vice versa. And that data will be, you know, bytes or kilobytes. So again, you can quantify all that stuff if you want. It's very hard to do it. It's intellectually dishonest to try and equate it uh, to carbon emissions, but, um, Again, energy use and its cost is only correlated to the security of the Bitcoin network, not the throughput and not the transaction volume of it. Um, and that's that. And I guess my last point on all this, man, I'm going a long time on this. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Uh, my last point on all of this is that Bitcoin has a fixed monetary system. The US dollar is not fixed. And when you have a monetary system that is not bound by the rules of physics or anything real, if it's just a lot of arbitrariness, humans will inevitably F it up and make a mistake. And humans have been doing this since the beginning of time itself. We constantly try to link currency to something hard. And when we fail, we decide to decree it. And when that fails, we decide to link it to something hard again. And the entire history of humanity's attempts to create money are littered with this. And if you actually just look at thousands of years of monetary history, you would think, how the hell did we even progress, right? We've just had one money after another fail, but you know, life goes on, you know, people make things work. And that's essentially the story of money is that when money does fail, people go back to the basics. They go back to actually having to create things of physical, tangible value to store their value and to move them. And Physical, tangible goods and bartering systems are just not an efficient way of conducting trade. Money in all of its forms will always fail. I think eventually if the US or you know, the world ever adopted Bitcoin, uh, there is some problem that maybe we aren't foreseeing right now that will cause it to collapse. But just because something isn't perfect doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to adopt it, to work with it. Bitcoin is as close to perfect money as humanity has ever conceived of in its uh, you know, sh tiny star of existence. But the consequences of having broken money are so much more than trying out a new money for humanity. It sets us back, it creates suffering, it creates wealth inequality, because essentially when you don't have a functional money, the only way that you have any wealth is by having things and by having power and control over people. And that's the world that we're moving into desperately. You have the have nots and you have the have yachts as Pierre Polyev would say. If you have physical things, if you have real estate deeds on paper, um, 
if you have gold, if you have things that are desirable for humans across the world, you can fetch a good price for them. And uh, you can always keep yourself afloat when you have those things. But we're moving more and more into a system where nobody owns anything. And the only way to have long-term prosperity is through ownership of things. You can create these facades of debt and borrowing and credit cards. And I can have, you know, cool iPhone here and cool car, car there and a mortgage on my house. But at the end of the day, uh, when money collapses, all those things you think you own, you don't really own them. You can't protect them with anything if you don't have money and you don't have a functional monetary system. And that is why Bitcoin is so important because it is the first monetary system where the rights cannot be arbitrarily stripped away from you. It is a monetary system that is rooted in ownership of physical reality, but it's all in the digital realm. And that concept, as esoteric as it is, is really the basis, I think, of flourishing in the future. And we can either decide to fight it and to only understand it uh, from a you know a tertiary lens to just eat what mainstream publications tell us about it, or we can dive a little bit deeper into it. You don't have to take my word for any of the stuff I'm saying. I probably got a few facts wrong, but the point is, is that if you want and you believe in humanity and you want us to flourish as a people, you're doing yourself a disservice when you just take one person's word for what the US dollar is or for what money is. Go out, do yourself a favor, learn about all these things. I am simply a messenger, try my best to spread all this to you guys. I'm doing a good job, I'm doing a good job, I'm doing a bad job, I'm doing a bad job, but I'm trying to learn every step of the way. And the only way that I learn is by trying to explain it to other people. So yeah, question your reality around you. When people tell you that the US dollar, uh, you know, is is what it is and realize that everything has a cost to it everything will consume energy everything will emit co2 the question is 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 it valuable for you uh is it valuable for more people and as subjective as th as that is uh try and base yourself in truth and eventually you'll find the answers to the things that you want as much as answers can provide any sort of relief i don't know what i'm saying um yeah that's it. That's it. There's some data points in here. There's something in here. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll dive in. I don't know if you guys have any questions about uh, what I was talking about or anything, but um, if you stuck it to the end, you get exclusive details on how you can get 30,000 environmentally friendly Satoshis. And here's how it's going to work. In the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to comment on this video link down below, so you'll have to refresh the page in about 15 minutes, or just keep refreshing it or whatever. I'm going to type up all the questions. Uh, the first person to comment all the correct answers to the questions, uh, I will heart your comment. And once I've hearted your comment, you can message me on Twitter, send me a lightning invoice or a Bitcoin invoice, and I will send you the sats. But you got to get all the questions right, and if I don't heart it, that means you didn't get it right. Uh, and it's the first person that gets the heart on the comment chain. So I'll have a bunch of the qu questions 15 minutes after the show. And uh, yeah, you'll get the 30,000 sats. All right, that's it. My mom was telling me that when I talk, I say, you know, you know, you know, too much. And I've been really trying to not do that because I used to say like and um and uh, and that's because when I'm alone in my room, I talk in... Uh, run on sentences all the time, but thanks for pointing that out, Mom. I will try and uh, not do that as much. All right, Barath says, I find it surprising that the U.S. military is consuming a significant amount of oil. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like they, they've the Pentagon actually is trying to do land vehicles that are better, and definitely like I think tanks from ten years ago versus tanks today. Uh, they get better mileage uh, with less oil, but yeah. Um, you should have a talk at UBC, Sustainability Hub. Well, I have differing views about climate change. I think there is... Um, I don't want to get into this, but I, I, I think there's more alarmism about climate change than actual risk. Um, and I also think that uh, it's not climate change we should be concerned about. It should be climate mastery. What is more important than us 
trying to change the outcome of emissions is trying to live with them and provide human flourishing with them. And uh, it just kind of kind of depends on your viewpoint. You either believe that humans are a net negative for planet Earth and all the other ecosystems that are not us, or you believe that humans actually have benefits or maybe are net beneficial to the rest of the planet. Um, that's really what climate belief comes down to. It's not about whether or not you believe, I think, you know, uh, X, Y, or Z emissions are bad. It's whether or not you believe that humans are good or bad for the planet. And so those are the conversations I like having. I'll dive into that. But like one of the ones I was talking about with a friend is that uh, everyone says, you know, human beings are so bad for the environment. They're bad for the environment. They're bad for other animals. We cause extinction, et cetera. It's like, yeah, those are, those are all true. But uh, honeybees, until humans decided to populate the earth, only lived on the equator. And honeybees are responsible for a massive, massive variety of flora and fauna all over the earth. And without humans moving them and transporting them to different places, um, we wouldn't have as much ecological variety as we do today. You wouldn't be able to get certain species here that weren't native. And so I think that, that if you believe that the earth is beautiful... Uh, because we can have all these different species of gardens and places they wouldn't normally grow, then you have to admit to the fact that humans kind of are a bit of a net benefit to the planet. We can grow things where, uh, you know, Earth would never let these things grow. And sometimes they're, they're bad for animals and sometimes they're bad for other plants in the ecosystem, but sometimes they're wonderful. And sometimes they can create food that other animals can appreciate and taste. Um, we're not perfect, but I think uh, when people say, you know, humans are only bad for the environment, I think they're just overlooking some some basic things. Uh, any comments on housing in Canada? Boy, I mean, I always have comments on housing in Canada, but I think housing in Canada is a prime example of what happens when there's no hard money. Uh, people need to put their money into something that will maintain its value. Uh, Canadians seemingly cannot create anything else except for housing and real estate. And it doesn't help that uh, we have some of the most anarchic and restrictive zoning laws. So the supply, I think, is artificially constrained in Canada. Um, but yeah, that's a whole other topic for another day. Um, one of the things I had an epiphany about the other day, too, was that inflation is affecting everything. But where we see the most inflation is in things we can't import. I think the U.S. and Canada have had the the benefit of being the prime reserve currency. So it means that when we import things from other countries, uh, we get to reap the benefits of those imports. And so if you think about anything that you can import into a country, whether it's food, electronics, um, anything that you can consume, consumer discretionary, all produced in China, whatever, like we're able to be got, be buy so much more of these things than we used to, even with all the inflation. Like we can now, you know, certain foods are cheaper, avocados are cheaper than they probably were in the 30s uh, relative to our purchasing power. Um, you know, computers, obviously, but anything that you can't import, like housing, education, um, direct services and medical care, those things have a way higher inflation rate. So that kind of shows you, you know, who really benefits from this reserve currency arrangement that we have. Um, only 34 times today, you know, I wonder if that that is even close. I, I feel like it's probably more. Global warming may be a good thing. Putin. Yeah, well, he certainly acts like it is. Global warming would be a great thing for Russia because most of that country is completely uninhabitable. Um, yeah, we think back, like, if you went, like, 600-plus years ago, like, we didn't have the technology to heat ourselves. Like, imagine trying to live in Russia before they had things like electric heaters and hand warmers and, you know, uh, easily manufacturable warm clothing. Like, you'd have to go out and, like, skin a, a bear or, like, a deer in order to just survive a winter versus just, like, clicking a button from you know, Alibaba. Uh, Russia benefits from technology, just like everyone else does, but also global warming. Um, there are hippos in Colombia due to Escobar, yes, and they're a very invasive species. So yeah, like, it's, I, I will say this, it's much easier to find examples of humans uh, effing up the earth than there are of examples of humans making the earth better for everything else. Like, I think it's easy to find examples of humans doing things to the earth that make it better for humans, but there's like that zero sum game where like, okay, it's better for humans, but it's worse for the planet. But there's very few examples of, I think, things where you can say, this is good for the planet and humans and the humans created it to begin with. So yeah, but I, I think honeybees are one. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but uh yeah, as far as I know, like you would not be seeing honeybees all over the world if it wasn't for humans. Uh, you know, honey, 
harvesting all this stuff like we have expanded that species and we're, we're killing them as well like it's not to say that honeybees are all hunky-dory like we led to the i guess mass creation of them and, and proliferation of them all over the world but we are responsible for also diminishing their population i just think like there's just aspects that people never consider and i like to always show that other side so yeah all right it is 2 20 p.m i have been rattling and ranting off to you guys for two hours and 20 minutes I'm going to cut the stream and then I'm going to post the trivia as the pinned comment below. Um, 10 minutes I'll have it. And uh, then uh, first person to give me all the answers. All the answers were in today's conversation, by the way. So you can Google them. But if you listen to the whole thing, then you'll know all of them. Um, and uh, yeah, when it gets 30,000 sats, DM me on Twitter if you get the hearted comment under mine. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for spending your Earth Day with me. Uh, go outside, even if it's raining, and uh, breathe in the fresh air. I'll be doing that very soon. And yeah, take care. And uh, I think I'll see you next week. I was supposed to do some trucker video this week, but it didn't happen, so I did this show. But next week, maybe I'm here, maybe I'm not. I'll be around, no matter what. So take care, guys. Peace.